Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the GG2 Leadership Series with our very special guest, Indra Nui. The GG2 Leadership Series is designed to explore and understand the personality, character, and qualities of a leader and share these learnings with a wider audience. We have been recognizing and celebrating success of ethnic talent for over two decades through the GG2 Leadership and Diversity Awards. The importance of diversity is familiar to most of us, and organizations who embrace diversity and inclusion reap immense benefits. The Asian community has made huge strides in many fields in the UK, including politics, medicine, the, ju the judiciary, and business, to name a few. But there is still much that needs to be done to create better understanding and create opportunities for minorities to excel into leadership positions. We explore many such issues and share knowledge and best practice through the GG2 diversity conferences. We were honored to have hosted Indra Nui at the GG2 Leadership Awards many years ago. I remember, Indra Ben, that you spoke to uh, Kabir Bedi mm -hmm. about his role in the James Bond film, Octopussy. Uh -huh. And am I right that you were exploring the opportunity to become a Bond girl? No, I said that was the only time. <laughs> no, no, no. I said the only time I could be a Bond girl, standing next to Kabir Bedi. Oh, OK. <laughs> that's, that's all I said. But it could still be on your to-do list. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> We are privileged and honored to host you today, as you are one of the world's most inspiring leaders. A little intro into Indra Ben. She was the first woman of Indian origin to lead a global American business when she served as the CEO and chairman of PepsiCo from 2006 to 2019. Indra Ben transformed PepsiCo, hiving off its restaurant business, engineering the takeover of Tropicana and Quaker Oats, and bringing about huge cultural change throughout the global business. And more importantly, she helped create a diverse pool of talented leaders. Her journey, her journey started from a quiet suburb of Madras to the United States, where she worked her way to the very top of corporate America, rubbing shoulders with CEOs, presidents, and prime ministers. Her story is an inspiring tale of grit, steely determination, and making choices and trade-offs as a business leader a daughter, wife, daughter-in-law, and mother. Indra Bin is, is in London to promote her new book, My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Fortune. <laughs> it's a brilliant, fast-paced book recounting her remarkable journey, and it's a book everyone should read. You can buy the book here, if you haven't already done so, or you can buy it later from our websites, easterneye and gg2.net. Our interview with Indra Bin and a review of her book is in the current edition of Eastern Eye, also available at all good news agents or online. <laughs> you will discover much more about Indra Ben with the help of, our, of insightful questions from our editor at large and investigative hound, Barney Chowdhury. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a poodle. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm her poodle tonight. <laughs> We'll find out shortly. <laughs> all, she needs, all she needs to do is tickle my tummy and I'm... Uh. <laughs> uh, and lastly, I would like to thank Tony Matharu for hosting us today at this beautiful hotel. Tony is a huge cricket fan, collector and builder of hotels, and a passionate leader for the London business community. Thank you. I don't need to say anything more, but I'm in front of a global superstar. And tonight, for the next hour... I didn't hour, hear that. What did you say? <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 I'll speak more clearly. I'm in front <laughs> no, of a kidding. global Please. superstar. Please. Sorry, it's my accent, isn't it? It's, 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 sort, of, it's sort, of, sort of too posh, isn't it? Mm. See, it's I think so. Um, so, there you are in a room, and you're with Barack Obama and Manmohan Singh. And Manmohan Singh, who's the Prime Minister of India at the time, turns around to you and says, Oh, you're one of us. And Barack Obama says, no, she's one of us. So what are you, American or Indian? Before I answer that question, I want to say thank you to the Solankis. You won't believe this, but when I was coming to the UK for a series of uh, uh, meetings and promotional events, I told uh, Little Brown that I want you to reach the Solankis. And I want to do something with them, because I still remember the GG2 awards from 
almost 15 years ago, and uh, how wonderfully it was executed, and the grace with which the Solanki family welcomed me so early in my uh, leadership. So this is my way of saying thank you to you. So, um, so that's why I'm here. I think I've done about 50 or 60 various events. This is the only event that I asked could you please do something for me? Because I wanted what, to read. What people don't know is that Indra came on a plane for 24 hours and then flew back to do the GG2 event. Yeah. So we thank her for that. We no, it. but it's the way, the grace with which the Solanki family welcomed me and uh, made me a Bond girl for just a <laughs> nanosecond. <laughs> but that's OK. Um, that Kabir sends his apologies that he can't be here tonight. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, am I Indian or am I American? I am, uh, uh, the duality in me is astounding. I'm still the kid that grew up in Madras in India, um, the world's largest democracy. I'm still the person that's thriving in the world's oldest democracy. So um, I owe a debt of gratitude to both countries. But I will say that, yes, India gave me a great foundation, but the way I thrived and the way I was promoted and supported and uh, um, allowed to reach or given the opportunity to run such an iconic company, I'd say only in America. Uh, and did you, when you came mm. to the States, and we'll come on to bits of that, but I'm, I'm very interested, how much of your culture did you bring to the organizations for whom you worked? You know, uh, forget the external appearance, we all morph into clothing that fits in. At the core, I haven't given up a single thing that I brought with me. I mean, I'm still a vegetarian. I don't drink. I don't go out. I don't smoke. I'm just a normal person. And so in many ways, I'm a misfit because everybody goes out to a party. I'm standing there with a glass of water because you know I just want to make sure that I get through the evening and get home in one piece. And very often, I'm going on a tip with my little uh, bottle of pickles <laughs> so that I can get rice and eat it with pickles because I have no idea what food I'm going to get. Later on in life, they sort of got used to cooking vegetarian food for me. So I don't know what I am, to be honest. But uh, there isn't the uh, person in me that's the, the, the girl from Madras in me, my family upbringing, who I am. That has not gone away at all. So let's talk about that. Uh -huh. You were very, very close with your grandfather, your dad. Mm. Tell me a bit about him and, and how much he influenced you. Um, a little man, five feet seven, and uh, I should, I mean, in our family, everybody was tall, so he was kind of a little man. And um, he was a uh, district and sessions judge, which means in those days under the British rule, he could preside over many, many, many cases. And uh, a brilliant man, he was a master's in law and uh, spoke brilliant English, wrote brilliantly, and uh, was a mathematician also. And he basically decided that his life was going to be devoted to his three grandkids. And that's it. His life was my sister, myself, and my brother. Um, the one story which didn't make it to the book because we ran out of pl uh, pages. Uh, you know, in geometry, uh, we get theorems, you know. Um, Euclid. Uh, yeah, the theorem, theorems are 100, 200 theorems. And at the end of every theorem are riders, uh, problems you have to solve. Every year in the beginning of school, uh, when we were doing geometry, my grandfather would buy a new notebook and answer every rider and keep it under lock and key in his uh, bedroom. So I asked him, why do you do that? He said, I'm getting old. If something happened to me during the year, I want you to have the answers to all the riders so you guys can learn how to do your geometry. And the way he would write the answers are not just an answer, but the logic as to how to solve the rider. And so... The man was not just devoted to us. He was completely and totally, his life was devoted to us. So I am a product of that grandfathering. More than that, though, he filled you with a desire that you were no different from a man, whereas in, in, in those days, women only went on to marry. Well, our family was a little different because both my grandfather and my father thought the girls and the boys should be treated equally. There should be no difference. And my grandfather kept saying, why should there be a difference? You know, if they have a brain and they want to keep doing well, let's encourage them. But my mother was the, uh, the challenging one because she, she would have loved to have been a CEO herself. She didn't know what a CEO was then, but I'm speaking in retrospect. She would have loved to have studied and gone to college, but she didn't have the opportunity. Um, and uh, 
So she always wanted to live life vicariously through her daughters. At the same time, society said the daughters had to get married at age 18. So she had one foot on the brake, one foot on the accelerator. And she struggled with which foot to press. So my grandfather and father helped with the other two feet on the accelerator. And that's why we were allowed to do whatever. But she provided the frame within which we operated. So we had freedom within a frame. And if we violated the limits of that frame, we got whacked really hard, physically and regularly. So um, I think that my mother's break, my father and grandfather's accelerator worked. Uh, and how often were you whacked? Ah, <laughs> me, probably every day. <laughs> because I would climb what, what trees. Your climb? I what would was climb your climb? I would climb trees, I would fall down. I would you were a tomboy, right? Total, total, complete. Complete. They're worried whether I'll ever get married because how, who's going to marry this one? <laughs> but, and, and here's the thing, you grew up in a multi-generational household. Yep. From there, I mean, we, we know that in the UK it still happens. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we know also that the generation, the multi-generational household is, is disappearing. They're putting mums and granddads into homes. But you took that, and, and that was really important to you, that multi-generational household, because you replicated that throughout your, your time everywhere that you went. I think multi-generational households work if there's intergenerational responsibility. Let me speak to that. Um, I had my mother or my in-laws or somebody from one of our families living with us at all points in time because we had two daughters to bring up. And we knew what kind of... Um, respect to give them. For example, if they wanted to run the household a certain way, give them that freedom to do what they have to do. Don't walk in and say, I want the household run this way. If, they, if you did that, then they feel like they're your help. Rather, we said, OK, what, what rights are we going to give them? And what are we going to put our foot down on? So putting our child to bed by 9 o'clock was something we insisted on. Left to them, they would have said 10 or 11 is fine, too. Because they'll say, we brought up kids ourselves. What's the big deal about your kid? Let's follow our own rules. So certain things like that, we put our foot down. But if they wanted to shop for certain things or run the household a certain way, we never asked questions, even if we didn't like it. So I think multi-generational households is a give and take. But each person has to have their role in the household. But a role that promotes the young ones in the household doesn't put them down. If I walked in home stressed out, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law would say, you're looking tired. Why don't you just go rest and, you know, just shut your eyes for a few minutes. So they wouldn't say, OK, here's the kitchen, take over. Never did that. And even today, uh, my mother-in-law, who's over 90, uh, the first thing she does when I call her is she'll say, are you working too hard? Why don't you slow down a bit? Are you eating? Uh, are you, every meal, every time. What have, you <laughs> had, what have you had for lunch? What have you had? That's my mother, every four times a day. But uh, I think that they were all vested in my success. My mother, my in-laws, everybody vested in my success, so in our success, but mostly focused on me. So Tell me about... Then it works. The multi-generational family works. So here's the thing. Whenever I speak to my daughter every mm. single day, or my wife, my conversation ends with, I love you. Never happened in your childhood. <laughs> I don't think in those days the older people said things like, I love you. It didn't, just didn't happen in society. And there's no point complaining because nobody you knew had their parents who told them that they loved them. Felt like that was only in the movies. I don't think my parents ever hugged me, ever, ever. It's not, it wasn't done. Um, and if God help, if we kissed my mother on the cheek or something, she would probably say, don't do that again. It was not done in the, in the family life that everybody in our community grew up in. Uh, the parents were treated with a level of respect that was just extraordinary. You could go hug aunts, but never your parents. And you know, the worst thing was um, if you came to them and said you'd like to discuss something important, like something is going wrong, I'd like to talk to you, they'd say, well, go tell an extra prayer. There, wasn't a, there was no conversation on, let me understand how you think, which is what I have to do with my kids, none of that stuff. So, it was, so you don't hug your kids? 
I, you, don't kick, you don't tell them. I, you I tell them I love them every two minutes if I can. You shout it out from car I window. Made up, I do everything. I make up for my parents not doing it, but it's a different time. Yeah. Don't forget I was born eight years after independence. Hmm. So this was early, early, early in the uh, coming out of India, and uh, nobody knew what one had to do. We were cut off from the bulk of the world. Yeah. And uh, the values that existed then, I mean, I'm sure many of you recognized it. The values that existed then were very, very, very different. People, audience-wise, how many say, I love you to your wife or your partner? <laughs> <laughs> Good. I encourage it. Fantastic. <laughs> Wow, Priceless. there speaks an Indian man. <laughs> how, 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 how reconstructed we really are. Okay. All right. So, so t tell us. That's a very practical answer. Yeah. 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 Man, a few words. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't think I could get away with it. Mm. Um, t tell me about logarithms. <laughs> uh, We're not talking about the maths, by the way. Well, you know, we were in high school and... Um, a girl transferred into Holy Angels, which is a school I was in, a good Catholic school. And uh, she was the daughter of an army colonel. And uh, she used to play the guitar. And pretty soon at lunchtime, we'd sit under a tree, the four of us girls, and start to play guitars and drums, little bongo drums. And we formed a little group. And the nuns called us logarithms because we were studying the logarithm tables those years. And she, they insisted that we had to be called the log rhythms, R-H-Y, as opposed to logarithms. And that's what we were. And we were the first all-girls group in Madras. We knew five songs, which we played every time to packed houses. And the demand for our music was unbelievable. We were recognized in the streets of Madras. It was like wild. I thought we were pretty bad. What were the songs? Uh, Obladi Oblada. Lennon McCartney. There was uh, Green Sleeves, Delilah. Tom Jones. Besame Mucho. And uh, House of the Rising Sun. Oh, the animals. Not the animals version. This was the logarithms version. <laughs> OK. Uh, and so has anybody got a guitar in the audience? No, don't even think about it. Don't even think okay. about so, it. So now, what do you do to relax? Now I listen to music. I read. Um, do you I play watch... the guitar? Do you play an instrument? Uh, I own every guitar that I could, I, I'd ever dreamed of owning, but it's all hung in my office on the wall. I look at it and marvel at it. Um, vanity took over, I grew my nails, so I'm <laughs> loath to cut the nails because you have to cut your nails to play the guitar. Right. So I haven't yet gotten to that but, elevated state. So when you have had a bad day, uh -huh. how do you relax? I read. I. Um, what do you read? Anything I can lay my hands on from biographies to romance books to uh, um, mystery books. I'll read three or four books at a time in different rooms of the house, wherever I am. I'll go pick up that book and keep reading. But I'll read like a maniac, not slow read it. And does your mind ever shut off? No. That's a genetic malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are you thinking? What, what, why do you, why can you not just sort of switch off? Because it's, it's nothing to do with me. The brain won't shut off. I, can't, I just can't do anything about it. I'm told you I'm wired differently. That is a problem to sleep or do anything, but uh, there's a second or third track going all the time. Just can't be helped. And in terms of role models, mm. early on you met Indra Gandhi, who was the Prime Minister of India. There's a lack of female role models around the world. I still believe that. Would you agree? There are many more now than there used to be then. I look around the world, wherever I go, I see prominent women doing fantastic things. Again, don't look just at the political leadership or corporate leadership. In the NGO world, there are women doing dazzling stuff around the world. In the World Bank, in the IMF, there are very, very prominent women. They come and go, but... Uh, you know, I was watching Geeta Gopina do an interview on television just a short while ago. Very articulate, you know, made a very good case for what the growth of the GDP in the world, the forecast was going to be as per the IMF and why. She sounded 
like she knew her stuff and she articulated it in a very good way. So I think if you look around, a lot of women emerging as uh, terrific leaders. So I have a tremendous optimism for the future. But there you are in Delhi. Mm. You're a teenager mm. and you meet Indira Gandhi. What did you take away from that meeting? You know, I was 15 or 14 at that time, and um, you're just in awe of Mrs. Gandhi at that time. Absolutely in awe, because she's such a, uh, just a powerful lady. She, she exudes power and speaks so well, and she spoke so kindly to each one of us. Uh, so you've, the first thing that you say is, oh, she's got my name, except she's got an extra eye inside. But that's OK, you know. Uh, you sort of uh, feel good about that. but. Uh, the fact that you met her is a big deal. I mean, we, I still have the picture of Indira Gandhi and me at home. Um, it's, it's almost incredulous, isn't it? Don't you think? Growing up where we did, to just go to some conference and you're going to uh, Barakamba Road and meeting her, that was a big deal. And uh, I, I can't even process, you know, those three, um, I went to three sessions, one after the other. The first was something called the Leslie Sony Program of Training for Democracy. 10 days in when I was 14 or 15. How I got picked, I have no idea. Zero. I get a letter in the mail saying, you've been selected to go to Devlali to the Leslie Sony Program of Training for Democracy. What is it? Uh, for 10 days, you're going, to be you're going to be taught all about democracy, the Constitution, elections, rule of law, how the court system works, all of this. And you have to study. They give you all the readings for every day. And you know, whether it's Nani Palkiwala or whoever was doing the election commission at that time, um, Brigitte Dalvi, who was part of the team that drew the line between India and uh, Pakistan. They were all there explaining how they did their work. And so the morning is seminars with them. In the afternoon, they would hang around and talk to us more. Now, I'm 15. What do I know about democracy and all of these topics? But in some way, for using some criteria, some somebody who's recommended my name. They took 15 people to Devlali and put us through this boot camp for 10 days. Now, when we were writing the book, Lisa, my writer, who used to be an investigative reporter for Bloomberg, she said, how did you get selected to Leslie Sony program? I said, I don't know. She said, come on, you've got to tell me how you got selected. Otherwise, it looks <laughs> sounds fishy. I said, Lisa, I don't know. So typical Lisa, she did detailed investigative journalism on how do you get selected to the Leslie Sony program. She drew a blank until she found some article in some microfiche written by some fellow who got selected to the Leslie Sony program in Aurangabad two years after I went to Devlali. And he writes there saying, I got this letter in the mail. I have no idea how I was selected. <laughs> <laughs> and so Lisa goes, OK, we have no idea how you guys got Second selected. Second source, you see. She second sourced it. Yeah. Good journalism. Yeah. Very good journalism. I felt better too because I don't want somebody to say, oh, but that was a lie. You know exactly how you were selected. I have no clue. But things like that just happened. And uh, those sort of programs, listening to Brigitte Dalvi, listening to the great Nani Palkiwala talk about the Constitution of India. I mean, we took it for granted then in retrospect. This is the giant in the world of constitutional law talking to a bunch of 15, 16, and 17-year-olds about the framing of the Indian Constitution. At any point, though, when you were 15, yeah. did you ever imagine that when you have that conversation with your 15-year-old self, that you would end up a global superstar? See, I've repeated it again. I have no idea what it is to be a global CEO, because everybody in my family was either working in a bank or in a government job or a lawyer. That's it. The first time we got a window into business was when my sister got admitted to IIM Ahmedabad. And she wrote the exam, and everybody in the family who knew anything about IIM Ahmedabad said, it's like getting a Nobel Prize. Don't be disappointed when you don't get in. Not if you don't get in. You're not going to get in. Just don't be disappointed. And then she gets in. That's the first time the family is beginning to understand there's something called the world of business. Till then, it's like, as long as you get a government job or a bank job, nine to five, where it's your home every evening, no work on the weekends, you focus on the family. We get you married to a good guy, and you have kids. That's very good life. That's our frame. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, you go to Calcutta. Mm -hmm. You do your degree in chemical engineering. 
No, no, no. I did my undergraduate in chemistry. Yeah, chemistry. Then um, did my uh, MBA from IM Calcutta. Yeah. So there you are. Mm. You then get a job. Mm. You go door to door selling threads. Mm. Um, what do you learn from that? Well, the good thing is in those days when you graduate from the IIMs, I think it's even today, the first six months, everybody goes through something called a management trainee program. So you don't start in the office. You may be hired as a product manager or whatever. The first six months, you either have to be in a manufacturing line or in sales. Mandatory. Everybody has to go through management training. So I started in Metur Beardsell, which had textiles and thread. I, the luck of the draw, I got thread. So I had to in Why Bombay. Luck the draw? Why luck of the draw? I'm saying it. Ironically, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, I, I, I didn't get that. I'm just yeah. a bloke. Do you, do you know how it is to go from cut and sew shops in Mumbai, in uh, Parel and Baikula, and all these little shops in the monsoons, selling three spools of thread here, five spools of thread here, oh, right. based on, you know, they cost nothing. But um, what I learned is business is done a spool of thread at a time. You can extrapolate from that. And when you do business with people, they're not just giving you their business. They are placing their trust in you. So if you showed up with the wrong blue of thread, of, of the thread that they ordered, or the color ran, their lot was damaged. So to me, it might be a spool of thread. To them, it's a lot and their livelihood. <laughs> and so when you do business with people, you've got to understand there's a huge responsibility that you're taking on. You're giving them a word. You're giving them. Uh, you know, your trust, so you're saying, trust me, I'm going to give you what you need. So I learned business from the ground up as opposed to coming top down. But more than that, you actually learned every colour, every thread that you sold. You have to, otherwise... Uh, and that's your trademark. You really dive into it. You learn it. You get professors to tell you about diets. You bring nuclear scientists in or, or whatever. Yeah. Why? I mean... Why do you go into such depth? You've got other people who can do that. Um, so I go to Motorola to work in automotive electronics. Okay, let me just pick that as an example. And I studied physics during the valve days. Now I'm in solid state. And Motorola is an electronics company. Everybody talks this language of electronics, bits and bytes and uh, you know, memory chips and all that stuff. I'm clueless as to what that is. And they're talking about EEC 4, electronic engine control 4 <laughs> in the car. Um, sensors, uh, actuators, all of this stuff electronically controlled, multiplex systems. And then they're talking about how anti-skid braking is going to replace something else. I know nothing about a car because I thought I got married so that my car would get fixed by my husband. So now I know nothing about cars and I'm a valve physician, physicist. I know nothing about solid state. And I'm in Motorola. What am I going to contribute if I don't know what people are talking about? So I hired two professors, one who came from, I think, 7 to 8 in the morning or 7 to 9 every other day to teach me cars. And the other professor came the other days to teach me solid state uh, electronics. And I was never going to design circuits myself, but I had to learn enough of the science and cars to be able to put the two together to survive in Motorola. If I didn't, I don't know what value I could have added in that com company. So I think if you don't go deep and learn the business, ground up, um, I don't know what your job is. It isn't about being in control. You're not a control freak. Or are you a control freak? Um, actually, going into the details and then you know, zooming in and zooming out allows you to give up control. I, I honestly believe control freaks are those who are insecure because they don't understand what's going on. If you really know what's going on, you know the people around you are doing a good job, so you can actually let them go at it. What does the name Norman Wade mean to you? My uh, first, I was just say, second mentor. He was the uh, uh, Macclesfield-born managing director of Metro Beersel, which is a part of Tootles of Manchester. And uh, you know, usually people who were retiring from Tootles would be sent for their last tint to run Metro Beardsell. And uh, that was my first job out of uh, IM Cal. I was uh, quite young at that time. And um, I graduated from IM Cal when I was 20, so I was 21 at that time. And after I finished my thread internship, I went to run textiles. 
And everything in that textile operation was not organized. It was crammed into shelves, didn't know what colors and prints we had produced. And I kept asking for the sample books. Nobody knew what it was. They said it's in this Godrich Bureau. So I opened the Godrich Bureau. Everything fell out of it. So I said, OK, I need to organize it. So I mean, like hundreds of swatches. So I just sat on the floor, and I separated all the swatches, and I started to organize them. Then I look up, and this six feet four Englishman looking down on me and saying, what, are, what, what in heavens are you doing sitting on the floor? I said, I'm organizing the swatches. Now, I was the first woman management trainee in Metro Biotsel. So he was coming to say, welcome to Metro Biotsel. There I am sitting on the floor looking absolutely <laughs> terrible. But I didn't care at that time. I just wanted to organize this whole thing in one day. And um, when I explained to him why I had to do this and why I needed to know what we had already done and what we were going to have to do, he walked away saying, I can't believe she's on the floor doing this, as opposed to delegating it to five people. I didn't have the luxury of time because we needed to design the next season's prints quickly. So rather than delegate, I mean, I didn't see any difference between me doing it or an assistant doing it. Why have this hierarchy? So I just said, everybody on the floor, we're going to get this done. So we got it done. And I think that experience, even though it shocked him, um, drew him um, to be my mentor. Well, uh, can I disagree with you? OK. I, I don't think he was your mentor. I think he was your champion. And I think there's okay. a huge difference. Yeah, I agree with you. He was my champion, supporter, everything. I, I, I think he did. Mm. And, and what the thing I noticed in your book is that men have championed you all the way through your career mm -hmm. rather than just mentor you. Would you explain that to anybody in this room who wants to be a leader? Why mentoring is OK, but you need a, you need a champion? I think the biggest difference is that mentors not just give you advice. They actually actively pull you up. They look for opportunities for you, um, you know, promotional opportunities, place you there, and make sure you're successful in that new job. And they create the environment for you to be successful. And that's what Norman Wade did in spades. And even when I was leaving Maitre Biersel to come to, or didn't take a promotion in Maitre Biersel to come to the US, he said, going to the United States is a better choice for you. Even though you're going to leave my company, that's a better choice for you. So he, cared, he put me before the company or himself, which, uh, first of all, we have to earn it. It doesn't come by itself. But once you get a supporter, hold on to them for dear life, because they're very few and far between. Yeah, because most people pull the ladder up behind them. Yeah. And you know, that, that's, that's really crucial, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so you go to America. Mm. You get off the plane at JFK. <laughs> what was it like? Um, I was in uh, La La Land, because JFK was quiet. Everything was beautiful, wonderfully organized. Uh, people walking in straight lines. Is this uh, irony again, or? Uh, no, I'm serious. Oh, okay. Look, look. I, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to take the chance. I'm no, a no, good journalist. Look, look. I left uh, Bombay Airport. Uh, for each family, there must have been 50 people to see them off. Okay, <laughs> huge crowds. The sound was deafening. I mean, the lines were out of control. Even now, it's much better than it was then. The airport was tiny. Um, and you know how Bombay roads are honking and nobody's staying in their lanes. There are no lanes. So I come into JFK. There are actual lines. There are little barricades for people to walk through. There's a process. Um, I wasn't used to that. And then when they say, go down and take the Connecticut limousine, which is a bus, to go to New Haven, there's actually a counter and somebody's waiting to give you a ticket. You get into a clean bus. And then you go down a road where the guy stays in the lanes and he puts the indicator to switch lanes. <laughs> I'm like, this is unreal, completely unreal. You might find it a bit amusing, but I've come from an environment where you change lanes when you feel like it, and you just honk. She's never driven in London. No, but, but this was, and I wasn't used to the fact that no cows wandered on the road or dogs wandered on the road. That's how it was in Madras and even Bombay in those days, even now. Yeah. And so uh, here are lanes, wonderful greenery all through uh, New York and Connecticut. And I'm looking at this going, how am I going to live with this quietness? That's what bothered me the most. It was so quiet. Then uh, got to New Haven, the loneliness seeped in until two days later, an Iranian student stepped up and said, let me teach you how to get a mailbox and a bank account and 
have you taste a slice of pizza? You can't be a vegetarian and not have pizza. I never had cheese in my life. I never tasted pizza. It might sound weird to you all, but those days we didn't have cheese in India, okay? So I'd never tasted cheese. I gagged on my first uh, <laughs> taste of pizza. He said, I have a suggestion, douse it with red chili flakes, it'll go down real fast for you. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah, see, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a detail in the book that, that really got me, which was when you landed at JFK, you took a taxi as well, and you spent $50. That's the Connecticut limousine. It's called the limousine, only it's a $50 bus. $50 in those 50 days dollars, is, yeah. is quite a heck of an amount. It's an hour and a half drive. But you only had $500. Yeah. Counting the pennies. Mm. Wow. Every, every dollar we counted. Yeah. But the thing you found about Americans is that they walked with a swagger. What, what, what do you mean by that? Everybody was confident. I mean, there was nobody sort of looking down and feeling. Uh, again, New Haven might have been an unusual place because it's a college town and everybody's going to Yale there. But everybody had certain, um, they looked at you in the eye, they walked straight. Um, they were always hurrying from place to place, which meant they had something to do. Nobody was loitering around, doing nothing. Uh, there was a lot of laughter. It was a whole different environment in my mind. I want to pick up on something that there's a theme through your book. Mm. You make a big deal of it right at the end. You have this complex about clothes and mm. appearance. Mm. I've got to let you into a little secret. Mm. I wasn't going to wear a tie. I've been forced to wear a tie. I hate wearing ties. Who forced you? Those two. Um, I think it's a good idea. <sighs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Jeez. Jeez. No. Anyway, look, so, so tell me about your concern with clothes and how um, you sort of cried because when you went to this internship, huh. it just didn't happen for you, uh, and, and the lasting legacy that it's had on you. Because you wouldn't, I mean, looking at her now, you wouldn't think that she has a problem with style, would you? Oh, my God. Um, it's not that I had a complex about clothes. I just, nobody ever told me what I needed to buy and how I needed to dress, okay? So in India, went to the American consulate, picked some uh, magazines uh, which had American clothes, had the tailor, local tailor, in the corner shop make some clothes. They were so awful, but I was so proud of them. So I wore them through the first year at uh, Yale. And then summer internship rolls by, and I needed an outfit to wear for the summer internship. I had only 50 bucks at that time to spend on clothes, because I spent it on books and other deposits I had to pay. And what do you get for 50 bucks? So I, I couldn't go to a Brooks Brothers or J Press in New Haven. I went to uh, Kresge's, which is the Kmart. Those of you who know Kmart is a discount store. And uh, when I took a, a polyester blue suit to try on, um, the, the fitting room, which I'd never been into until then, had a drape in front of it as opposed to a door. And I was too afraid to change in a drape, in a draped room for fear somebody might look in. So I decided to just take the clothes home and try them. And tomorrow's my interview. I go home and wear it the next day morning. Uh, the trousers are about this high, and the jacket's two sizes too big. But the blouse is good. Um, shiny polyester, felt pretty good. I didn't have the right shoes, so I wore these orange suede shoes with big plastic base. I was very in vogue those days. And I walked into the interview room, and sitting around were all these elegant women in their Brooks Brothers suits and pearls. I didn't have a complex. I cr almost died. Uh, so to use the word complex is an understatement. How dare you insult me like that? <laughs> it was terrible. You know how embarrassing it is? You walk in, and everybody's like looking at each other going, what the hell is this creature that walked in? It's like they're having some sort of a sartorial seizure. So I do the interview. Um, I muster all the courage, I do the interview, and then I run to the development, the head of um, career development, Jane's office, and I say, Jane, everybody's laughing at me. She says, yeah, look, you look pretty bad. I mean, really <laughs> bad. I said, what am I supposed to do? I can't buy another outfit. I didn't know you could return things when it didn't fit, okay? Because I never bought anything in the US at that time. And so she said, what would you wear if you went to an interview in India? I said, I'd wear a sari. I have lots of saris. And she said, tell you what, do you have another interview tomorrow with a consulting firm? Wear a sari. If they won't hire you 
for who you are, then it's their loss. She gave me that confidence. Now, two wonderful endings to the story, again, I say only in America. First is, I did wear a sari the next day to my interview with Booz Allen Hamilton, which was a consulting company, and the partner came from Texas. Texas, Bro Castleman, I still remember him. I don't think he even cringed a little bit when he saw me in a sari. The interview was professional, a case, took me through the paces. And the job I interviewed for with that ghastly outfit gave me an offer that evening, okay? And then I got an offer from Booz Allen and I took that offer. So I guess they figured the raw material was there, you know, the clothes part can follow later. But when you were at Pepsi, yeah. somebody whispered in your ear that you need a makeover. Not whispered, just called me up and said, hey, <laughs> I need to talk to you. This was a young design consultant who was working on Gatorade. And uh, I was CEO at that time. And he was like a design consultant on Gatorade. People normally shiver when they talk to the CEO. This guy comes to me and says, Mrs. Nui, can I chat with you for five minutes privately? So I thought there was something very wrong in Gatorade and he was doing a whistleblower or something. <laughs> so I said, sure, Gordon, let's talk. He went up then he said, I'd like you to come to Saks Fifth Avenue Club tomorrow in New York and I think I, you could do with a makeover. And I'm like, I should either throw him out or <laughs> do something. I was nervous, upset, scared, a little uh, uh, anxious. I don't know, I had all kinds of emotions. And for that split second, I'm wondering what should I do. I did know that I dressed a little badly. I had a skirt that came down to my ankle because I thought my legs were way too skinny. And uh, um, my jackets, I noticed now, were all too big. So I n know that I did not dress elegantly. I know that. Um, so when Gordon said, I'll see you at Saks on Saturday morning, I showed up at Saks. Sort of not feeling great, but I was now intrigued. And in this big dressing room was organized all kinds of spectacular clothes, all matched, the right bag, the right jewelry, the right shoes, uh, you know, a jacket with a, you know, a dress with a jacket. And I'm looking at all saying, no way, everything is up to the knees, just below the knees. I'm not going to show my legs. He goes, uh, just try it on. Just try it for my sake. And change inside. I'll make sure nobody comes in. There's a fitting lady. Let's just try it. And I did. And I loved the look. And he gave me a little album of what to mix and match and how to dress. I still have it with me. It's my treasured possession, only because that was the first time somebody actually told me how to dress well. You see, I did, I, the lesson I took away from that mm. is about great leadership, which is no matter how small you are, mm. no matter how low you are in the company, the CEO, a great leader, listens, actively listens and takes away. That's a lesson I took away from it. And the leadership was from, that I was demonstrating yeah, leadership? absolutely, yeah. Huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take that, I'll take that. At that time it was, it was not... I'll pay you a compliment look, here. Work <laughs> <with you. laughs> I, I tell you what, there isn't a person in the company, it can be the janitor, the security staff, who wouldn't give me input and advice, which I didn't listen to. So to me, it was not unusual that I listened to everybody's point of view. Yeah. You, you keep on saying this phrase only in America. Yep. Does this happen? Where are we going wrong in the UK when it comes to that? Because I've got, I've got to be honest with you, I was asked this question only yesterday. You know, I've, I've got to do a QA. and a And I said, well, the problem is white people just don't get how to listen to or take orders from or um, take direction from people who are non-white. Mm. So what, what, where will we go wrong in the UK? I don't know. That's a deep introspection you need to do here. From my perspective, um, maybe it was the time that I came into the corporate world and the fact that I worked so hard to um, distinguish myself, not through anything but work, uh, reached a point where even when the men went off for golfing or fishing trips. You never I joined them? No, because I had kids and I don't golf or fish. But the fact of the matter is I knew no decision would be taken in those meetings without me being involved in that decision. How did you know that though? 
Because I worked for bosses who basically said, don't you dare make up your mind to do anything unless you run it by Indra, because if she doesn't like it, we're not going anywhere with this decision. Let's just be clear about this. But uh, it wasn't all plain sailing. You, you threatened your CEO once, to walk out once. because they weren't supportive of you. Not that they were not supportive of me. A couple of people on the senior executive team would constantly attack me when I was presenting something, and I, the CEO was quiet, allowed it to happen. I put up with it for a few meetings, and I said, I quit. And then all the behavior changed. But uh, I did could you say... Mean to, did you mean to say that? Had you had enough, or was this a bluff? No, not at all. I, once I say I'm quitting, I'm quitting. That's it. But um, the way the behavior changed, he called everybody in. I don't know what transpired between closed doors, but everything changed. But again, look, maybe uh, I just kept doing things without raising my voice. But when I did, he acted immediately. In, I mean, literally, in hours. You didn't shout at him. You didn't raise no, your no, voice. No, you, no. You, you calmly explained to him. I just said to him, um, tomorrow after the board presentation, I'm leaving. I don't want one thing from PepsiCo. I don't want a bonus. I don't want a payment, nothing. I'm just leaving. He said, for what? I said, look, you've been watching these meetings. I can't take it anymore. And I'm leaving. That's it. I said, so let's get ready for the board presentation tomorrow. So um, I wasn't threatening. It was just, I was just going to walk out. Was it because you're a woman or was it because you're a woman of color that they were aggressive and assertive and I, I taught no idea. I have no idea. That I was assertive and aggressive? No, that they were. The men. I don't know. I have no idea why they were tough on me. Those very men became my biggest supporters later in life. But at that time, they were not particularly OK. But they talked over you all the time. Mm -hmm. But that's OK. That's very common. Men do it all the time. You do it at home with your wives. You don't come, you don't know that. <laughs> Trust me, I, you, I, I'm scared of my wife. So. They all say that. Look, all the men say that. Look, all the look, men look, say that. I, I hate to say this. I hate to break this to you, gentlemen. Today, today is my wedding anniversary. Oh, happy wedding anniversary. Right? I've had to have special written permission to be here. <laughs> so that's how scared I am of my wife. That's, that's the way they all talk. Let me ask, show of hands, how many of the women say the men talk over you when you guys are talking? You just do a little show of hands. Oh, I rest my case. <laughs> that's deserved. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, what I meant is in a business uh, setting in particular. Um, the, I think it may be years of history. I don't know what it is. But um, uh, you know, there has been a lot of talking over women when women were in the room. It's changing because now women are beginning to call it out. So things are changing. Look, you can look at everything as a cup is half full or half empty. Things are, have progressed. Things are getting better. Let's focus on that. Yeah. I want to talk to you about your husband, Raj. Mm. Um, so I met my wife, and you know, I, I proposed to her on the third day. We got married nine days later. What happened to you? Why did it take you so long? To get married? Yeah. Because I was in New Haven, he was in Chicago. Although the first dinner that just he and I went to, uh, we saw a movie, Silver Streak. The only movie that doesn't even have a hugging scene, I want you to know. It's a comedy, an absolute slapstick comedy movie. We had a great time. We went to dinner. At the end of dinner, we decided to get married. And it was as simple as that. And then I went back to New Haven. He was in Chicago. Then three days after I graduated, we got married. What made him so special? Uh, when you meet him, you'll know. Well, look, I, I'm not going uh, to meet him, so there, there's got to be some way that we blokes can sort of feel good about ourselves tonight, right? Um, he, uh, our marriage is completely equal. Uh, so if I need support, he's always there for me, and if he needs support, I'm always there for him. And it's not just him, his whole family is that way. So in many ways, I had a very lucky choice in my husband and the family that he's from. How lucky. I, 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 want, I want to deep dive into that. Mm. Because here you were, and in your memoir, you say you worked and you worked and you worked. In fact, when you were having your second child, Tara, um, you were on maternity leave and you still worked. Mm. Why? When you reach a certain level in the company, okay, so. You can be on maternity leave. The company is not going to stop for you. So there I am, 
in ABB, one third of the company is run by my boss. And he's looking to make, he's getting a call to consider a big acquisition. And I would do all of that stuff for him, okay? So he's, he's not asking me to come back. All that he said was, your body had the child, maybe your brain can contribute a bit. Okay? He's right. I can just lie in bed and tell the team whatever they had to do. So that's what I did. And the team said, Indra, you shouldn't be working. I said, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to come and sit in a meeting, but I'm going to give you direction. And I did. The point is that it's not that I went back to work. I didn't go back to the office. I stayed home for all those months, three months. But uh, uh, if there's something... You just had a newborn. Sure. It's the most bonding time. The baby sleeps and sleeps and sleeps. <laughs> I'm not going to win this, am I? No. No, look, look, the, the job was also a baby for me. My baby was also a baby. And I would never do anything to jeopardize the fact that I had a child via C-section and I had to care for the child. But, you know, my team is sitting in the dining room. I'd bark out orders for them to look, yeah. on, look at things. They went back and did the work and life went on. When you have a sit-down conversation with your daughters, Mm. and with your husband today, right now. What do they say to you when you have those frank discussions? About what? About you were never there. Um, they'd say you were never there, but you were also there at critical moments. I think all kids would like to have more their mother than their fathers around. Even if you're there, they'll say, God, I wish you weren't there all the time because you're watching over them all the time. Uh, or they'll say, I'm glad you're there, and they go off to do their own thing. So you wonder why you're home. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, I know that feeling. Being at home is a wonderful thing for them. At the same time, it's not a necessary thing. Um, for sure, they'd have liked mom to be there all the time. But they also know their mom is a certain way that she would have been miserable just staying at home. Because you actually did. You actually said to... Well, at one point, yeah. for a brief moment, I said, maybe I should just quit and stay home. My first daughter, who's the one who wanted me to stay home, said, well, I'm not sure I want you to stay home. What I'm really talking about is two mothers, one mother who stays home, one mother who's doing what you're doing. And my little daughter said, Mom, you worked so hard to get here. Why would you ever quit? Dream big, Mom. This is my little baby. But you also did something else, didn't you? You, you had great assistants who mm. would almost be a surrogate mother to them. Yeah, my secretaries all stepped in and took over but my you, kids. But they, but they would, your daughters would ask you for permission on something. They would take away. Talk off. me through the process of, 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 of what, of your methodical yeah. step by step. <laughs> Remember, those are the days where we didn't have cell phones and texting and FaceTime, none of that stuff. So the kids had rules on Nintendo. This first Mario Brothers, remember the old game? How long they could play Nintendo. So they would call the office. I'd be in Japan or someplace. And if they call and say, I'd like to talk to my mommy, the receptionist or the secretaries knew it was my daughter. Because only they would call and say, I want to talk to my mommy without explaining who it was. And I'm not CEO at that time. I'm, I'm just CFO. president, I think, yeah. or CFO. Yeah. And they'd say, oh, hi, Tara, what's up? Uh, I want to play Nintendo. And so they've been trained. Uh, have you finished your homework? So they'd go through a checklist that they've all been given. <laughs> they'll go through the checklist. And uh, because they're all women who've had children, so they know what the drill is. They'd go through the checklist. And then they'd leave me a voicemail saying, Tara called, we went through these questions, we gave her permission to pay Nintendo for half an hour. So, it, so when I call Tara, it can't be me saying, how dare you play Nintendo? There's got to be a seamless transition. Um, because she knew it was middle of the night for me and I was asleep, at least hopefully I'm asleep. So they didn't want to uh, create chaos. So uh, I think that it is impossible to juggle home, work, children, all of that stuff, unless you have a support structure. In my case, my husband and I both worked. So I had a support structure with my secretaries, my neighbors, family members, everybody who helped, except we had to have wonderful communication with each other without the benefit of cell phones. What regrets do you have in terms of your career versus your family? Um, you know, as my first daughter said, I wish there were two moms. <laughs> one mom stayed home, one mom went to work. I think. Anytime I talk to, no, let me rephrase it. 
many women I talk to who are highly educated, who quit their jobs and stayed home, have deep regrets that they didn't keep working. And I'm talking about deep regrets. They say, God, I could have been somebody. I could have had the power of the purse. I could have had economic freedom. Especially women who are in fragile family situations where you know, the spouse has left them with the kids or there's been domestic abuse or something like that, they feel it even more. So I think that um, as I look back, um, you know, I have no regrets about having gone to work. I would still do that. And I would tell... You wouldn't change a single thing? No. I mean, remember, when, we, when I was a young kid, my father was in an accident. And he almost died, but he recovered, and the rest is history. But had he been unable to work, I don't know what would have happened to the family. So I know... Is that what drove you? I don't know if that drove me, because I buried it in the back of my head. But in retrospect, in writing the book, all of that came out, and I realized the fragility of families is real. Fragility of families is real. Families are messy, families are fragile. And we should not forget that. Do you think you won the lottery when you met Raj? No question about it. He too asked the question and reversed it. <laughs> so can we just clear something up, please? Who proposed to who? I don't know. He says I did. I say he did. I don't care. 42 years later, we're still arguing that. So it doesn't matter. Uh, and your daughters, what will happen to them? Will, will they, are you expecting them to go through an arranged marriage? No. Are you kidding me? There's, they are in very independent girls. They can do whatever they want. They can get whatever. I mean, they're all working. They've all got their MBAs. And uh, um, they should meet and marry whoever they want. The only commitment my husband and I, I've made it on behalf of my husband and myself, is that <laughs> if uh, they have kids, we'll take care of the kids. And it doesn't matter whether one turns around and says, look, mum, I'm gay, or um, another. Whatever. They, they're my kids. Whatever they are, they're my kids. That is so refreshing. Yeah, they that are really my is. loves of my life. Yeah. We're, we're coming to the end of, of the conversation with you. Um, so I've got some questions, if that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Ask away. Three tips for women who want to get to where you've been. Mm. Three tips, please. Um, First, d decide for yourself whether you really want to make this journey. Because it's a pyramid. The organization is a pyramid that narrows enormously as it gets to the top. So the journey is not easy. And if you want to make that journey while also having a family, better build a big support structure and have incredible courage and resilience to go through the journey. Otherwise, uh, it's just not worth it. Tell me about Steve Jobs and how it transformed what you did for Pepsi when you were CEO? In one area, I mean, he is the one who taught me about design. At least told me that I needed to infuse design in everything in PepsiCo and that I should go hire myself the best designer and create passion in all our products. But it didn't work, did it, the first time around? Because your people didn't do what you expected them to do. They were lazy about it, or they just didn't take you seriously. I, the, I realized the problem, and he told me I had to hire the best designer and bring design into the company. I realized that my senior executives didn't know what design was. Not that I knew what it was, but I was reading as much as I could. I was buying books and reading it. Uh, they were virtually clueless on what good design was. What they thought was good design was not design. It was just, just something. So I had to go out and hire a whole team, which we did. And the rest is history, because right now we're winning every design award in, in the past. But at that reserve. point, when, they, when your team didn't listen to you, how did you cope with the micro, microaggressions that uh, you must have faced? You can't just brush it away. I on. did, because at that point, it's their loss. Had they invested a little bit of time to learn But design, you were CEO. Doesn't matter. They're, look, it happens in every company. A CEO gives you an instruction. Some people really do it, other people do it half-heartedly. That's OK. Then you know who to keep and who not to keep. So it just happens. Talk me through a conversation mm. of letting somebody go. Letting somebody go. Again, depends because on they, what, because yeah. they d Because they didn't do what you wanted them to do. First of all, you never let somebody go because they didn't do what you wanted them to do once. You give them feedback and say, look, I expected this deliverable, this quality, and this date, and you didn't do it. 
let me tell you what was lacking in the product you delivered to me. And I wouldn't like to see that happen again. And uh, so you give them very clear feedback on what they didn't deliver and uh, why the quality was lacking. You have to give them feedback. Um, then you watch them. You give them a little bit of help to get to the next project and see if they can deliver. And if they don't ask for help or they don't deliver what they're supposed to, then you tell them that they have a couple of choices. They can go down a level and work their way back up or they can go out their choice. But uh, if they don't pick one of the two, then you tell them, look, I think you're better off in some other place. So three strikes and you're out? Has to be. You've got to give people a chance, though. It's expensive to hire somebody. You've got to be very careful before you let them go. And America's pretty litigious. I don't think we worried as much about the litigation part as much as we did about we need good people in the company. Cost so much to hire them. Can't we remediate people when they don't work out? In terms of racism, mm. there's a bit in your book where Gerhard uh, is, is rented a house mm. and you go to get it with Raj mm. Mm. and suddenly it's off the market. Yeah. You decide to let it pass. Why? You, even though it was just clear racism, why did you not confront? And do what? But don't forget, Gerhard also said, I don't want the house. So I had the support of this incredible boss. At that point, you've got to decide which battle you're going to fight. That point felt it's their loss. If they're not going to give it to somebody who's going to pay the rent on time, an extraordinary rent on time, it's your loss. So we went and got a better house. And, uh, and looking back on your life in America, and only in America, did you face racism? Yeah, off and on. But again, you have to be careful to define the country on the 95% of the people that are wonderful, not the 5% that are not. So I focus on the 95. And my journey has been made possible by the 95. So people in the audience, mm. they're bosses. You don't leave a company because you don't like the job. You leave a company because you don't like your boss. Okay? Manager quality is a big, big factor in many people's uh, decision to stay or leave. And the reason they leave because of the manager is because if he's a bad, he or she is a bad manager, that means the culture of the company tolerates it. So there must be something wrong in the culture of the company. So what's your advice? What's your tip for somebody who has a bad boss or there's bad culture in the organization or they're facing racism? What, 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 or, or they're facing sexism? What, 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 what's your advice to them? I mean, look. In today's world, where there's a war for talent, you need all the best and brightest working in the company. So you can't afford to be too picky about one kind of race or gender to work in the company. You've got to go for the talent as opposed to uh, trying to recruit somebody just like you. Uh, and all of us know that just having somebody just like you may make the decision process better, uh, I'm sorry, quicker, but not better. So you've got to recognize that diversity around the table actually improves the decision making. However, if the tone at the top accepts bad behavior, if your HR department does not intervene when they see bad behavior, when there's no organizational health survey that's done to assess what the tone of the company is, then the company is in trouble. Uh, as long as you have org health scores that you do and you look at the scores very carefully, by subgroup and by ethnicity, you cut it and look at it carefully. And the CEO and the head of HR are also looking at it, and not just delegate it to a diversity officer. The mainstream leaders look at it and want to do something about it. It works. Company so, cultures will change. See, th there is this idea that one person can't change a company. Mm -hmm. um, one person can change a company, can't they? If you're the CEO, you can set a tone at the top. It takes time, but you can change a company. And but if you put one head of diversity who's not the CEO, who's not the decision maker, and is usually on the sidelines, it's hard to change the company. So it has to come from the top, diversity. It has, to has to be creative diversity, not just racial diversity, That's right? Correct. But how do you empower your team? How do you, how do you, because they're afraid to fail. That's, they don't want to let you down. How do you empower them to do that? Well, you know, uh, Steve Reinemann, what he did, my predecessor as a CEO, was the best thing because he said, 
You can't create a diverse organization, make people feel included, unless you force numbers into the company. So he set up a scorecard which said parity hiring, parity promotion, parity retention. So if you're going to hire 10 people, five people are going to have to be diverse. Go find them. And unless you hire the five diverse people, you can't hire the five non-diverse people. So he uh, tied up bonuses to that scorecard. Not that we liked it, I'll be honest with you, because it was very, very hard to hire people. But he said, they're out there, you just don't look for them hard enough. So once we got a critical mass of people in who were diverse, we could build inclusion programs on top of that diversity. And he watched everybody like a hawk. And so I actually... Where did he find the time to do that? You're busy running a multi-billion company. But people, is the biggest, people are the biggest uh, uh, asset of any company. So if you don't focus 20, 25% of your time on people, it doesn't matter what else you do. And Steve did a brilliant job at that. I've, I've got to give him credit because he set the stage for me. What did you do to bring women in, to bring ethnic minorities in? Um, Every job that was open, we made sure the slate was diverse. And uh, we had goals for, we publicly published goals on what percentage of senior management and the company was going to be uh, d people of color or diverse people. And we'd reported on progress in our GRI reports every year. So the whole world knew exactly how we were doing. Um, and we were not always successful. Sometimes we might lose a person or two to some other company that raids you, which is inevitable. But uh, we were honest about that, too. Uh, and then we'd go back and fill the pipeline. So uh, we, built, we built a talent pipeline, quite a, quite a good one. You're a Hindu Brahmin. Mm. How much did that moral, ethical, religious faith, call it what you will, how much has that shaped your journey? I probably did quite a bit. Um, you know, learn to live with that much. Don't aspire for too much money focus on education, um, you know, all that stuff that typical South Indian families, I'd say more Indian families of the, that time, uh, sort of uh, put into their children's heads, stood me in good stead. I think the biggest difference was in the Brahmin household, it was live very simply. You know, I don't think I grew up with matched furniture in our home. Um, and if we had to have curtains, for the entire house, the same fabric was purchased, and the tailor stitched curtain for the whole house with the same fabric. So there was no design ethic growing up, OK? And so it was like, why is furniture important? You can sit on the floor, on a mat. Why do you have to sit on a chair? Why do you have to sit on a dining table and eat? So these were the questions that were always asked. Why do you spend money on that? Spend it on education for the kids. You want to study French? We'll pay for French. You want to study German? We'll pay for German classes. Anything you want to study, we'll pay for it. But don't ask for clothes or how many clothes are you going to wear. So our cupboards would be threadbare, literally, two shelves with odds and ends clothes. But we never asked for more. So the culture we grew up in was material goods are not important. Education is all that matters. And I think that's a great culture to grow up in. It may not work today, but that's the way we grew up. What advice would you give to your 16-year-old self? <laughs> Sometimes I want to say, don't change a thing. Just keep doing what you did. It's OK. I think the only thing, um, looking back, um, I, I, maybe I could have rewired myself to be a little bit more relaxed and enjoy life some more. I feel like I enjoyed life, but I didn't really relax and do nothing and just chill. I didn't do any of that stuff. So sometimes I wonder if sometime in my life I'd do that. But I missed the prime years of my life doing all that. You write in your book that once, you, once you're a CEO, people want you, they invite you. Mm. Hillary Clinton, Hen Henry Kissinger, mm. the whole works. What about today? Who's on your speed dial? Who have you got on speed dial? Uh, all of them are on the speed dial because they're all retired. <laughs> We have a wonderful retired persons club. We all get together regularly. Um, I think you've got to go into the CEO jobs knowing that your position gets you a lot of invitations. It's not personal, it's positional. And if they disappear after you step down, you should not say that you know, life is over or you've become a lesser person. It's irrelevant. Position 
has enormous attraction. What have you got left to do? You're young. What do you still want to do? Um, I have to get this care system, uh, work with all the people who are working on care to make sure that we put in place a great child care system to start with, to help young family builders, you know, um, have a family and still engage in paid work. If they don't have family support, if they don't have multi-generational family support, they need an you know, organized care system. So there are a lot of people working on it. And my job is to just convene them and see how we can move this agenda forward. You say only in America, but I think they need that in the UK too, guys. Am I, am I right, right? Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a big round of applause for him? Uh -huh. Thank you.